All right, we will uh, satisfy the critics. We will hang a weight from the inner ring so that gravity and not I shall put on the torque. And there you see a procession. Not the sort of movement you really expected because you are accustomed in higher mathematics to a torque producing an acceleration. Here, a torque produces purely a rotation. And if I put three times the mass on, I get three times the angular velocity. A different sort of device from our common experience. Now, what I want you to notice this time is, I'll spin it up again because it's getting a little slow. I want you to notice how it accelerates when I put the weight on and how it decelerates, especially how it decelerates. Having been convinced that a torque produces a velocity and not an acceleration, it must have an acceleration or it couldn't increase its velocity at all. And it must have a deceleration when it stops. So let us see if you can determine the rate of deceleration from that sort of angular velocity. When it comes round, I'm going to catch the weight and watch it stop. Ready again? Hop. There is an acceleration, but it is of a simply enormous value. Let us try increasing the torque by increasing the radius at which things happen. I put this long arm on, and of course it will precess anyway now because of the uh, out of balance mass there, but I can now hang a weight on there and the precession rate increases because the radius has increased and if I hang it on further along I get a still bigger precession rate if I hang it right at the end you'll see it do something else besides merely go around at constant speed I think I need a fresh spin hang on incidentally this shaft has a peg in it. When you buy a toy gyroscope, it has a hole in it. The first thing to do when you've bought a toy gyro is to fill the hole in with a peg that sticks out because you break the string in a hole and you never do from a peg. Right. I'll reinsert the torque arm. Come on. Yep. When it comes round, I'm going to hang this weight on and I'm going to let it drop rather fiercely. You see it going up and down as it goes around? That process is called nutation. It is the result of an, an acceleration as well as a pure precession. Now, the two worlds. The fact that I can press on that and produce a precession of that either way has got nothing to do with the fact that I can press on that and produce a precession that way because I can hang a weight on this side and at the same time I can then attempt to make it go faster than it was going before by pushing on there just like our volunteers and you see the weight comes up or down now we've got something new because a weight rising means an increase in potential energy where did the energy come from? the answer was it came from my finger because now my finger was moving as it pushed when I pushed on it and it was stationary it didn't yield at all so there was no power input and even though there's movement of the inner ring there is no power output because that moves without being capable of producing any torque if I resist that motion then of course it immediately gives way to me so these are the two worlds separated for you as they never are in electromagnetism we have again been able to make the invisible visible to dare to make the intangible tangible. Now, scientific gyros are beautiful things like this in gymbarines that maintain their axis of spin, but the real magic lay in the toy gyroscope, the one you've seen come down the string. Toy gyros are usually supplied with a little Eiffel Tower model 
And one of the standard tricks you're supposed to do is to spin the gyro, put it sideways on the tower, thus allowing the force of gravity down on that to be reacted by a normal force from the top of the tower. So you're putting a torque on about a horizontal axis and that will make the gyro precess about a vertical axis and everyone is amused. And no one takes it seriously because it is, after all, a toy, isn't it? Fine. Most interesting demonstration. Uh, let us just weigh these two things. First of all, we will weigh the gyroscope. That's the old one. That's it. We will weigh the gyro, and we find it to be 310 grams. There are 312 grams. We will weigh the tower and find it to be <coughs> less than a gram. So over 300 times the weight of the tower. Now, haven't we missed something? Thank you, Bill. What did we miss? We missed the fact that if you ever try to rotate something which is eccentric, not symmetrical, you tend to... Yeah, somebody knows, they've tried. <laughs> you, uh, you tend to shake your bones to pieces. <laughs> now, what is happening when I do that? Apart from me getting in terrible shaking, the whole of this is trying to retain its centre of mass fixed. Let us look at the gyro again with that sort of thought in mind. Surely, 300 grams compared to 1 gram, you would expect the 300 grams to want to stay in the same place and you'd expect it to move the tower around itself. But of course it is our common experience that although that happens, the gyro on the tower does not make the tower go round the gyro. 300 times the mass, whoops, sorry about that. Can you scream back in his bearing? Friction on the table. I can hear my critics now. He has friction. We thought we would uh, remove as much of the friction as we could by spinning it on ice. Yeah. Oh, it's come off the tower bill. Right. We estimate that the coefficient of friction between the tower and the ice is about 0 0.02, which is just about as small as one could expect to get without going to something exotic. Uh, it's a little bit tight on the bearing, man. Could you give me the pliers? Did you do it up with your fingers? Yeah. Oh, it's all right, I can manage. Just a wee bit tight on the pivot. Ah, oh, thank you, man. This, of course, is an adjustable gyro. This belongs to an earlier age. Nowadays, they make the flywheels out of aluminium, and what better metal than something that's uh, one of the lightest we know for making a flywheel? So, there it is. This is the modern uh, high standard of living. This is an old-fashioned gyro about 30, 40, 50 years ago. We have some gyros here today that are 100 years old. So here's a thought. This thing has been with us for 100 years, and we haven't noticed those things which we might have noticed. A tower on ice. Are you convinced? I was. <laughs> now this is something that needs following up. And following up means getting a little more scientific and in particular making it a bit bigger so that friction has less effect. A gyroscope that can move about the vertical axis and when I undo this clamp it has the freedom to drop as well it is a more sophisticated model of our gyro on the tower let us spin this one up and see what happens mm. no 
that a beauty? You can see a little mutation taking place. I can do the trick I did with the two worlds. I can make it rise up by pushing it a little faster. Notice the precessional speed now is very large because the torque is very large because the gyro is offset a long way. Now, suppose I'd clamped that there and tried to rotate it at that same speed. Watch what happens. Why did it topple? I can't get up to anything like the speed I should do before it wants to take off. It appears to exhibit no centrifugal force. Suppose we were to take this gyro out and put it in a box so that you couldn't see that there was something in the box that was spinning. I'm going to spin it up, put it in the box that you can't see, and then we'll weigh it, and then we'll put it back on there, and we'll ask a question. They're quite things to handle these when they're moving. Put him on the balance. And he weighs about 30 ounces, nearly two pounds. They put him on the machine. Can you tighten up the nut, Bill? Thank you. Unclump the middle. There is a black box containing you know not what. And I give it a push the other way. There it goes. I pushed it round. There's a two pound mass with a real angular velocity and no angular momentum. No angular momentum except from the dead weight. It's not rotating. Because if I want to stop it, there's no energy required to stop it, no effort, energy release, because I didn't give it any when I began. Let us go one stage further with this to something bigger, something more scientific we can make measurements of. If we go to this machine, which has little buckets around the outside so that I can uh, blow air on them and get it spinning to a, a quite high speed. Uh, something like uh, 5,000 revs a minute. Don't be alarmed by the noise. When we get this eight pound wheel up to speed, I shall take a pin out there to allow it to flop like this. And then we shall do experiment number one, which is to search for centrifugal force. If I bring out the gyro to that position, it is free to topple over. I shall need, in fact, a little weight to hold it down. Of course, in any other position, it's all right. It's only when the offset mass comes out there that it weighs over like that. Now, we'll spin this up, and then I'll take the weight off and ask Mr. Coates to catch the gyro as it falls. Come around there and ready to catch it when I lift the weight. Next time around it's coming off. <laughs> he cheated again, says the man in the gallery. Did he really? Yes, he pushed the aluminium back a bit. All right, he'll pull it forward a bit. More than a bit. Pull it forward a lot. The whole of the tower is now well outside the end of the bench. And if you want me to prove it, I'll show you what happens when the wheel is stationary. Again, it doesn't require much catching, you see. It's gentle as a lamb. Now we'll put the pin back in, and we'll see by how much it overbalances. Well, a lot, obviously. How much? That much?